Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. As true crime lovers, we hear a lot of awful stories, but there are a few that stand out from the others for one reason or another. Sometimes they're extraordinarily sad, sometimes they're extraordinarily gruesome, and sometimes there's something just so different about them that we can't help but remember them. We're talking about one of those stories today. This is the story of the murder of Hella Crafts, commonly known as the wood chipper murder. Let's get into it. Hella Crafts was born in 1947 and by the mid 1970s was working as a Danish flight attendant for Pan Am Airlines. Her husband, Richard Crafts, was a pilot for Eastern Airlines. That is how the couple met at work. Richard was making $120,000 a year as a pilot. That's over $400,000 in today's money. That's not what pilots make now because pay rates have not kept up with inflation. We all know that. But suffice it to say, he was making a very good living. After dating for a while, Richard and Hella were married in 1979 and they settled in Newtown, Connecticut. The couple had three children and by all accounts, Hella was a great mother and wife. Richard, on the other hand, he was a different story. There are varying accounts as to how quickly the marriage went south, but it definitely went south. Richard worked not only as a pilot for Eastern Airlines, but as a part-time police officer. People describe him as a cold man. He was aloof and emotionless and far from friendly even with those he worked with. He was not particularly well liked, not even by his wife. Hella wrote her mother letters, telling her that she was desperately unhappy and that she wanted a divorce. She also wrote letters to her friends and her fellow flight attendants. She gave these letters to her friends and told them to read them in private. All of the letters said the same thing. If anything ever happens to me, don't assume it was an accident. Her friends were, of course, shocked by these letters. They knew that Richard had hit Hella on many occasions and that he was abusive, but they had no idea until they received these letters that the situation was so dire that Hella feared for her life. When Hella's friends pressed her about their concerns, she told them about Richard's explosive temper. She said she was terrified of him. She also told her friends that he spent money like there was no end to it. And at times, she wasn't actually sure where all the money was coming from. Hella told her friends that the children were often traumatized by their parents fighting, and she had just reached a point where she couldn't stand any more of the abuse. By the mid-1980s, Richard was having multiple affairs. He was never home. He didn't spend any time with the children or with his wife. And the marriage was, of course, a very, very unhappy one. By 1985, Hella had had enough. Her friends urged her to take action. And Hella decided to hire a private investigator to look into just exactly what her husband was doing and where he was spending all of his time. The PI Hella hired was named Keith Mayo. Not long after Hella hired the Mayo Detective Agency, all of her worst fears were confirmed. Hella met Keith Mayo in a parking lot on a rainy day, and they sat in his car together as Keith revealed to Hella what he had very easily uncovered. The private eye was able to take many, many photos of Richard with his girlfriend at the time. The photos showed them being affectionate, touching each other, and offered proof that yes, there was a romantic relationship going on between the two of them. Hella was devastated, but honestly kind of relieved to have her suspicions confirmed, and she knew what she had to do. She filed for divorce and prepared to end her marriage to Richard Crafts. She told her lawyer the same thing that she had told her friends in the letter she sent. Don't assume it's an accident if anything bad ever happens to me. November 18th, 1986. Hella arrived in New York after a long flight from Frankfurt, Germany. She rode in a car from the airport with her friends and her fellow flight attendants, and they dropped her off at home late in the evening. The next day, Richard appeared with the children at his sister's house in Westport. 
He said they had just come for a visit, despite the fact that there was a terrible snowstorm happening at the time. Hella was not with her family, but apparently that wasn't a big enough deal to arouse any suspicion at the time. A few days went by and Hella was scheduled to be back at work. She did not report for work and she missed her assigned flight, which obviously as a flight attendant, that's a really big deal. She did not call into work and when her friends called to check on her, they were not able to get in touch with Hella. People then began calling Richard. He told the first callers that Hella had left the country to visit her mother in Denmark. He later told other concerned callers a completely different story. As soon as the private investigator Hella had hired heard that she had missed work, he went straight to the police department. But because Richard was part of that police department, the private eye could not get them to look into Richard as a suspect in Hella's disappearance. This is kind of a common theme where police protect their own. Hella's friends were persistent, calling Richard daily, demanding to know where their friend was. Like I said, he told different people different stories. After telling some that Hella was in Denmark with her mother, he told others that she was visiting the Canary Islands with a friend. He told some people that he simply didn't know where Hella was. He said they were having some serious problems in their marriage and that he didn't care where she had gone. Weeks went by and no one could get in touch with Hella Kraft. She was not with her mother, like Richard had said, and her mother didn't know where she was. All of her friends were contacted. They didn't know where she was. Hella Crafts had vanished. Keith Mayo, the private eye, is frustrated that the police will not investigate Hella's disappearance, and so he undertakes an investigation of his own. He goes to speak with the Crafts live in Nanny, and he videotapes their conversation. In this footage, the nanny explains to Keith Mayo that she saw a dark stain on the floor where none had been before. She tells him that she asked Richard about the stain the next day, and not only did he ignore her, but that the following day, there was a large piece of carpet missing from the home, the piece of carpet that had the stain on it. The nanny then goes on to tell Keith Mayo that the family chest freezer that had always been in the garage of the home was gone. So we've got all kinds of red flags going on here and it just makes you wonder why these guys ever think they can get away with this. The nanny also gave Keith Mayo a receipt that she found for a new chainsaw that had been purchased by Richard. If that wasn't enough, she also tells Keith that she found a receipt with Richard's signature on it where he had rented a commercial sized wood chipper. I just cannot help but laugh at the stupidity. There's blood in the house. You buy a new chainsaw and you rent a wood chipper and you wonder why people like me end up sitting here talking on camera about people like you. Keith Mayo gathers all of his evidence, the nanny videotape, the receipts, and he takes it to the Connecticut police. December 1st, 1986. Friends of Hella's, along with Keith Mayo, are finally able to persuade the police department to take action and an official missing persons case is filed. Keith Mayo was convinced that Richard Crafts was involved in Hella's disappearance. And like I've said, he went to the police numerous times demanding something be done because of the missing mother. But because of this conflict of interest, Richard being a part-time police officer, the police department had to kind of recuse themselves. The county prosecutor ended up referring the case to the Connecticut State Police to avoid this conflict of interest. On December 26, 1986, while Richard was vacationing in Florida with his sister, troopers were sent to the Crafts home with a warrant. Inside the home, they found pieces of carpet taken from the master bedroom floor, just where the nanny said it would be missing. They also found a blood smear on the side of the bed's mattress. And in addition to the blood smear, there were five tiny little dots of what appeared to be blood on the mattress. During the execution of the search warrant, police gathered the bathroom towels that had been freshly washed and were hanging above the bathtub. All of this evidence was taken to Dr. Henry Lee. I'm sure many of you know this. Dr. Henry Lee is a pioneer of forensic science. He has come under some criticism in recent years, and some of that appears to be justified criticism. 
But also, we have to remember, he was pioneering a brand new type of science, blood spatter science. So it's no surprise that he was not perhaps always 100% correct. When science changes, it doesn't mean it lied to you. It means we've learned more since then. Back in 1986, Dr. Lee examined the mattress and determined that Hella Crafts was most likely struck hard on the head while standing by the side of the master bed. As Hella fell, her bleeding head brushed against the side of the mattress, leaving the smear. This is Dr. Lee's theory. He then takes the freshly washed family towels and applies a chemical to them, which turns bright blue, indicating they are covered in residual blood. Someone had used those towels to clean up a large amount of blood and tests revealed that the blood was human. Further tests also revealed it was type O, the same blood type as that of Helicrafts. Missing from the house was not only the chest freezer, as I mentioned earlier, but the main bedroom sheets and comforter. Richard Crafts is pulled in by the state police as soon as he returns from Florida and is forced to sit for a polygraph. Now, we talk on this channel all the time about how polygraphs are unreliable, but the polygrapher in this case said that Richard Crafts showed absolutely no emotion during his test and there were no indications that he was lying when he asked if he killed his wife. Just for their proof, they don't work. By this time, word of the missing local mother had spread throughout the area and it reaches a man who has some information. Joseph Hines comes forward. He worked for the town of Southbury and he drove a snowplow in the winter. He remembers that on the last night Hella Crafts was seen alive, the night of November 18th, he noticed a truck parked close to the shore of Lake Zor. The truck was a rental truck and attached to the tow hitch was a wood chipper. He remembered it because it was so odd and out of place in the dead of the Connecticut winter, but also because he had seen the rig at 3.30 in the morning and standing outside of that rig was a man in an orange poncho. Why not? Why not wear a bright orange high visibility poncho? You've already bought a chainsaw, cut the carpet out and rented a wood chipper. Maybe some of those big spotlights that crisscross, you know, at the car lot when they're having a sale. He just, he should have got those, just made it complete. Guy's a moron. About an hour after Joseph saw the rented truck and the wood chipper near the lake, he saw it again near River Road. Now, the lead homicide investigator of the police force, a man named Marty Oradon, asks Joseph Hines to take police to the location where he saw the truck and the wood chipper. So he takes them there near the bridge over the Housatonic River and tells them this is where he first saw the man in the orange poncho and the rig. Police begin searching the area and they do not find a body. They start going through the wood chips that they find in the area. As they search through the piles of wood and debris, they find something. It's an envelope and the mailing address on the envelope is addressed to Hella Crafts. As they continue to carefully sift through the debris at the location, they notice something else. They are finding human hair, a lot of human hair. Detective Oradon recalls he turned to his supervisor and said, if this guy did what I think he did, it's time for me to retire. December 3rd, 1986. Police continue to search through the sand and the dirt and the debris along the river for the next few days. They find some blue fibers and they also find an odd looking piece of metal. They find many small fragments that look like they could possibly be bone. After a few days of nicer weather, the sun melts the snow a little and searchers come upon another item. It's a painted fingernail. At this point, they're convinced. Hella Crafts has been murdered and put through a wood chipper. They bring in divers, and for hours they search the bottom of the river until they make a major discovery. It is a chainsaw. It's the same make and model as the chainsaw on the receipt found at Richard Crafts' home. And another strange detail, it has the serial number filed off of it. Well, he's definitely thwarted the police by filing off the serial number of the chainsaw that he purchased 
with his credit card and left the receipt at his house for. Case is over. All of the found items were taken in for laboratory testing. And while that process is underway, the case becomes a national sensation. I was too young to remember this. Yes, we've finally reached a case that I don't remember, but it was all over the news on a nightly basis. Richard Crafts maintained his innocence and loudly protested to anyone who would listen, also pointing out that he had passed a lie detector test. Back at the lab, the experts realized they have got to find small pieces of evidence to tie Richard to this murder. They start examining the chainsaw and find on the teeth of the chainsaw a very tiny bit of human tissue. Now, like I said, they also found these blue fibers and those blue fibers they found at the house match what the nanny has told them was Hella's favorite blue nightshirt that is missing. They know they've got to prove that Richard Crafts bought the chainsaw, but like I said, the serial number has been filed off. Well, you've seen enough true crime to know that even when you file the serial number off of something, you can't always get rid of the impression that it makes deep down in the metal. So the investigators go to work on this for a bit, and after removing a little bit more of the metal using some acid, they can clearly see the serial number 5921616. It matches the serial number, not only on the receipt, you guys, he sent in the warranty card. He filled out the warranty card for the chainsaw with the serial number on it and his name and his address, and he mailed it in. <laughs> How is this guy a pilot? How is he smart enough to be a pilot? I mean, it, it just... Investigators end up finding about 2,600 hairs in that location by the river, and every single one of them matched under a microscope. So they were all the same hairs from the same person. They then went back through the evidence they had collected from the Crafts home, and they had Hella's hairbrush. They matched the hairs they found to hairs from the hairbrush. They were the same. They then turned their attention to the found fingernail. Police had collected a bottle of fingernail polish from the Crafts home. That nail polish is taken and compared under a microscope and with chemical testing to the nail polish found on the fingernail. They match. Now all of this is fantastic evidence, but think about it for a moment. Think about it from the prosecutor's standpoint that has to prove this case. Hair and a fingernail don't prove that someone is dead. You can lose a lot of hair and fingernail. That doesn't mean you're dead. So Dr. Henry Lee contacts Dr. Albert B. Harper, who is a biological anthropologist. Dr. Lee asks Dr. Harper to examine the small fragments of what he believes to be bone. Dr. Harper examines them and says that yes, the fragments were human bone, but that he would need something to compare those fragments to in order to prove that they had been sent through the wood chipper. Dr. Henry Lee then sets up a test. They get the exact wood chipper Richard Crafts had rented and they put a pig through it, pigs being very similar to humans biologically. They then collect the fragments from the pig and as Dr. Harper examines the bone fragments of that pig that had been through the wood chipper, he finds that they have the exact same striations and markings on them as the bone fragments found at the riverbank. He says, yes, he can confirm that the bone fragments found at the river have been through that wood chipper. The type of bone found and the amount of bone found is enough to convince the coroner that no one could have survived this type of bone loss, so the coroner then rules that a homicide has been committed. Now remember, this is before DNA, so how do they prove that those bone fragments came from Hella Crafts? Dr. Harper took the bone fragments and he froze them with liquid nitrogen. He then ground them into a powder and tested that powder. He can confirm that the bones came from a person with type O blood. Again, the same type of blood that Hella Crafts had. It's really quite fascinating. Even before DNA, they did have some methods that helped them link bone and blood and hair. I find it incredible. 
Lastly, they turn to the strange piece of metal found during the initial search of the riverbank. That little bit of metal turns out to be part of a dental crown. Dr. Henry Lee then contacts Dr. Gus Karazoulous, who is a forensic dentist, and he agrees to go search the riverbank. After days of searching, Dr. Karazoulous finds a human tooth that has been missed. He retrieves Hella Kraft's dental records from her local dentist, and he is able to match and say for certainty that the tooth and the crown both belong to Hella. At this point, there is no doubt, Hella Crafts is dead. January 1987. The Office of the Connecticut State Medical Examiner issues a death certificate and Richard Crafts is immediately arrested. He is placed in custody and ordered to stand trial. The trial began in May of 1988 in New London. Prosecutors laid out what they believe happened. They believe there was an argument between Hella and Richard in the bedroom. Richard picked up a large police flashlight and hit Hella over the head. She fell next to the bed with her wound brushing the mattress on the way down. They believe Richard then placed Hella in the family freezer, rented the truck and the wood chipper, and loaded Hella inside the freezer into the back of the rented truck. He then drove to the lake where he dismembered her with a chainsaw and put her body parts through the wood chipper. During the trial, the Crafts housekeeper and nanny, Dawn Marie Thomas, testified about the stain she saw, the missing carpet, and the missing freezer. She also told the courtroom that on the day of Hella's disappearance, Richard had allowed her to go home early. Hella's mother, also testified, and during her testimony, the letter in which Hella said she was going to divorce Richard was presented as evidence. A Southbury policeman named Richard Wildman also testified, stating that on the 21st of November, he saw Richard as a colleague with that wood chipper and asked, what the hell are you going to do with that? He said Richard replied, saying he had some limbs around his house, oh, tree limbs. Oh, that was not great writing on my part. He had some tree limbs that had come down during a snowstorm, fallen onto his property, and he was going to clean his yard up, use the wood chipper to put the tree limbs through. Oh, Lord, Stacy. Richard Crafts took the stand in his own defense. He sat in the witness chair at age 50, dressed in a blue shirt and a striped tie, and he testified. When he was asked if he used a chainsaw or a wood chipper to kill his wife, he calmly replied, no, sir, I did not. Richard's defense strongly objected to the admission of items seized during the search warrant, including the carpet samples, a second comforter, and a pair of men's shoes. The attorney stated that the proper channels had not been followed to obtain the search warrant and so that all the items should be thrown out of court. But Superior Court Judge Barry Schaller ruled that the search warrant was in fact valid and he allowed the items to be presented at trial for consideration. The jury went into deliberations and a single juror refused to convict Richard. It apparently got so heated that that juror actually walked out of the courthouse and refused to return. So due to the stubbornness or maybe stupidity of one person, the trial ended in a hung jury. A second trial began in November of 1989, and that trial ended in a guilty verdict for Richard Crafts. On January 8th, 1990, he was sentenced to serve 50 years in prison for the murder of his wife, Hella. This was the first murder conviction in the state of Connecticut without a body. So where is Richard Crafts now? Well, you're not going to believe this. I, what am I saying? Yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. He was just released from prison after serving just over 30 years of his 50 year sentence. Apparently when Richard was in prison, these laws changed in maybe the 90s and they allowed prisoners to work off large chunks of prison time if they had good behavior. And I mean like years and years. Now those laws have been changed back and are now much more strict. But because Richard fell into a window of time that allowed him to essentially work off years and years of his sentence by being a good prisoner, he's out. It, 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 it's, 
I, I just can't, people get mad at me because I smile when I talk about this stuff, but it's just, it's unreal to me. It's laugh to keep from crying. Bro, he put his wife through a wood chipper and he's out of prison. So in January of 2020, Richard Crafts was released from prison and allowed to live in a halfway house in Bridgeport. He is 82 years old and the house he is living in is part of a program for veterans. As of right now, he is set to be released from this halfway house in June of 2022. He will not receive any kind of assistance after he is released, so he'd better hope some good Samaritan or family member is willing to take him in. Now, I'm sure a lot of you either know this or have figured this out at this point, but if you didn't already know this, yes. This case is the inspiration for the movie Fargo. What a fantastic film. If you've seen it, you'll remember that at the very beginning of the movie, there is a screen graphic that reads, this is a true story. The events depicted in this film took place in Minnesota, 1987. At the request of the survivors, the names have been changed. Out of respect for the dead, the rest has been told exactly as it occurred. Now, of course, that is the Coen brothers quirky way of saying some of this is true, but not all of it. But when asked about this in an interview, the Coen brothers said that, yes, the true events we've discussed here today are what inspired parts of this great film. I remember seeing Fargo for the first time back in 1997 and thinking, this is different. This is a different kind of movie. It was something unlike anything I had ever seen before. I was young, I had been going to just kind of blockbuster stuff, and the Coen brothers, of course, have their own style. I absolutely love this film, and I credit it with starting my love affair with the Coen brothers films, and honestly, with indie and alternative film styles altogether. In this masterpiece of cinema, a kindly, somewhat bumbling, and very pregnant sheriff played by Frances McDormand, fumbles her way through a disappearance that, yes, ends with a very graphic and very memorable scene involving Peter Stormare's character standing outside in the snow using, using, shall we say, a wood chipper. I don't dare show you the scene because of the rules here, but you remember it. If you haven't seen Fargo, I cannot recommend it enough. And if you have seen it, see it again. It's a rare film that I just can't get enough of. Like I said in the beginning of this episode, there are true crime cases we all remember, and then there are true crime cases we all remember. It's interesting to us as true crime lovers, and it's entertaining to us as moviegoers, but it was in fact based in tragedy. This tragic murder and horrific disposal of Hella Crafts, a sweet mother and wife, will forever be in our memories and part of American true crime lore. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Like the video if you would and subscribe to the channel if you haven't, it helps me out a lot. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.